is, how is everyone today? Thanks for coming. Great, love to hear it. Um, so today we're going to be talking about volunteer opportunities. Hopefully you're in the right place. Um, and we are going to hear from, a, we have some representatives from a few different agencies here today, so we're lucky to have them. Uh, we have, if you can look over here, if they're still chatting. We have Robert Pearson here from Norfolk County Volunteer. Res Oh my God, I can't even speak today. RSVP, Retired Senior Volunteer Program. We have Amanda from New Life Furniture Bank. And we have Carol Hopkins. Hi, Carol. From HESCO in the Meals on Wheels program. Uh, and we have three representatives here from the MRC, uh, the Walpole Medical Reserve Corps. So we're going to be able to hear from them. They're going to talk a little bit about their agencies, the mission of their agencies, and uh, the different volunteer opportunities that exist. Um, I'm going to first speak a little bit about the Council on Aging here and the opportunities that we have at the center. And then I'm going to turn it over to each of them to speak a little bit. Um, hopefully they'll stick around afterwards and we have some information over there and some applications. So if you have some specific questions about um, a, a possible match, that would be great. Um, so, and I'm also really happy to see a number of our volunteers here uh, from the center. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the, you know, what, what you can do for us, but I'm really hoping that some of the volunteers will feel comfortable to speak up about what volunteering does for you and, you know, how, how we can work together. Um, here at the Council on Aging, you may or may not realize we have about 75 active volunteers, um, as opposed to the eight part-time employees we have here. So as you can imagine, we rely on the volunteers quite a bit. Um, you really help us do what we do. You help with the success of the programs, um, the day-to-day -day operations, and the real the sense of community that we have here. Because you know you're giving to the center and really making it what it is. So thank you. I always thank our volunteers. They're great. Um, I'm going to talk about the different volunteer opportunities. I have my cheat sheet because I always forget the list. There are so many of them. Some require. Um, you know, a little bit of time, some require more amount of time, we're flexible with you and your schedules. Um, some require more skill than others, um, as you'll see. Um, the front desk, our volunteers at the front desk, you'll, you interact with them all the time. That really involves a lot of you know, computer skills, phone skills. Um, we have a number of people that work out there and we rely on them heavily. Uh, the fitness room monitors, we have a couple of you here today. Thanks, Joanne. She fills in lots of roles. Um, our fitness room, it, it, we have people up there to sit and monitor, and it sounds like a simple job and not very skilled, but we wouldn't be able to have the fitness room open if it wasn't for those volunteers. So we have shifts. It's 8.30 to 11.30 every day that they're open, split up into two shifts a morning. And it's really just, a, you know, we ask that you sit up there and just to make sure that if there's an emergency, there's somebody there that can call for help. Simple job, but really important to the operations of the fitness room. Uh, we are going to be launching a breakfast cafe, which we've been talking a lot about. Um, out in, this, in the cafe part of the center, we're going to be serving breakfast and we're looking for assistance there. Um, I've interviewed a number of people, so you know, we have some people to start out, but that'll be critical as well for, the, for that program to take off and take place. Um, program, this is where most of our volunteers fall into, the program assistance. <clears throat> we have volunteers who help out with gardening, are there out there, the beautiful gardens that we have out back. We wouldn't have those if it wasn't for volunteers. They do all the planting and the maintaining of the gardens. Um, we have the helpers with shopping on the van. Our gift cart volunteers, they're out there right now setting up the gift cart. That's a program that they developed on their own. Um, trip coordinators, uh, if you have a special skill to share, we welcome the ideas and the opportunities to do that. We have um, a painting class, a drawing class, technical assistance. All of those people are volunteers, and they run that program. They came to us with the idea, and um, it's wonderful to have that. Um, 
mahjong leader, cribbage leaders, all of that as volunteers. Uh, volunteer for the group coordinators like pool and senior moments, uh, knitters, coordinating the donations that we do. Um, if you have a special hobby, we have walking group leaders, uh, as I mentioned, the gardeners and the knitters. Uh, and then we also utilize people for the special events that we do here. We, um, some large scale events like the dinner dance um, that we do, the holiday open house. We have a number of people who are volunteers just to help out to execute those programs. So that's something that we're always looking for as well. Um, I have applications available. It's a simple process if you're interested. You know, please, if you have any ideas, bring them to me. I'm happy to listen and talk it out with you. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over to our next friend, Carol. Do you want to come up? So Carol from HESCO is here. She's going to be talking about Meals on Wheels. We work very closely with Carol, as you know. I'm sure you all see her in the kitchen. Thanks, Carol. Hi. Good, a good afternoon, everyone. Actually, I came into the Meals on Wheels. It is a paid position for me now, but when I started, I started as a volunteer. And I think my biggest um, concern was um, how much time do I have to give? You know, and will I be allowed to just do that amount of time? You know, so it's a little bit, you get a little nervous. You don't want to go in and then say, I can't do it or I can't come these days. But you have to remember volunteering. You're giving your time. If you need to take a day off, it is not a problem. Usually, everything works out. There's always another volunteer who could pick up the slack, and you'll do the same for them. So I think that's a very big concern when you are going to go volunteer. You just don't want to jump into something and feel like you can't fulfill it. And that was my concern when I started. So when I started, I needed to control my time. So what I did was I stayed in the kitchen this is just my story of how I got into it because I was a little concerned. And so I could control my time by doing that uh, opposed to delivering meals at the time. And that worked out great. And I met so many friends. I met friends that were friends of my parents that were there. And my now boss at HESCO's father-in-law was there volunteering with me. It was just amazing. And you'd go home feeling like, wow, this was really a nice experience. You know what I mean? And I stayed for like five years. And, um, and then I, I learned, you know, the workings of the kitchen and different things. And so I was offered a position, you know, five, six years later. So I would have to say if anyone's thinking of volunteering, just jump in and, and you'll meet friends. And by now doing the Meals on Wheels program, it is unbelievable some of the volunteers that come in and you're helping someone, you know what I mean? You're not just dropping a meal off, you're getting to know that person, you know how they sort of, how their day goes, why they're not answering the door, just different things, and now you, they become friends. You know, they're now your friend, and how I do it is you do the same route every week, so you, they know you, they know who's coming Tuesday, they know who's coming on Wednesday, and then you know their routine, so many times it's always a safety check, because you might be the only person that they will see all day. So if they don't answer the door and they don't have a car, you can just kind of usually sense, well, and they'll come back and tell us. And many times, it was a safety check. There was a problem. And um, so that's, that's the added plus for you, is that you are a safety check for them and the family. So getting back to if you're thinking about volunteering for whatever program, jump in. Guaranteed that you will really, you really like it. OK? And that was my story. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carol. Definitely a feel-good yeah. role. Feel -good yeah. Um, next, we're going to call up Medical Reserve Corps. And I don't know if there's one of you that wants to speak specifically, or all of you. All of you. Come on up. So we have um, Barbara, Kathy, and Nancy from the Medical Reserve Corps. Who gets it first? Nancy. All right. The lady in red. So, um, Medical Reserve Corps, the first thing I want to say is there are lots of things to do that are not medical because I will tell you right now, I never have been, never want to be anything medical, nurse wise. So, there are lots of other things to do. Um, the Medical Reserve Corps uh, came into being after 9 11 when the federal uh, government decided there should be more local 
emergency uh, p people, people who are prepared to take care of things. Walpole's been very lucky in that we have not had any major catastrophes. We've probably over all of the years maybe had two winter sheltering, but we're prepared in case we need to. Um, I myself started off back in the 80s with uh, hazardous waste, um, so forth, and recycling and all of that business in the local. And then uh, over the course of time, the Board of Health decided that we would establish a medical reserve corps. We're part of a region, so there are 34 communities that have medical reserve corps, but we are standalone. We can work with other regions, but we are standalone. Um, we take care of clinics, running the flu clinics and so forth. Um, we are prepared for sheltering if we needed it. Uh, we have a large, um, what should we say, a truck that has a lot of our equipment in it, and once in a while we'll go in and inventory to make sure we have things in case we need them in an emergency. Um, I myself, I do a lot of traffic control, meaning make sure the lines are flowing, maybe greeting people. Um, there are other ways to uh, volunteer that are not um, medical, uh, registering and so forth, and they will talk about all of the different uh, ways that those can be done. Basically, we work closely with the Board of Health and the health director, and we are ready if there were um, anything that was threatening public health, uh, if there were mass, mass casualties. But there are lots of community services that we do as well. Hi, everyone. My name is Barbara, and I'm one of you. And um, I started with MRC because I love Walpole. I've lived in Walpole for over 40 years, and I um, raised my kids here, everything, and once the kids went off, it was like, okay, now what? And I volunteer for other places as well, but I wanted to do something with my town, so I was looking at the different volunteer opportunities in the town, and this kind of tickled me, because it's the type of thing that, like a lot of the people have already said, you can do in your own time, um, it's not a heavy duty commitment, but at the same time, you're giving back to your community. Um, one of the things I do also is the different clinics. And like we have flu clinics, so we offer flu shots for everybody in town. We're gonna do one here actually, so I'll see, hopefully see some of you here. Two here? Two here. And um, we did the COVID, during COVID, we did the COVID shots and we did COVID clinics. And so, one of the things with the volunteering is, again, like I said, and, um, you can choose how many hours you're able to volunteer, but also what you do. Some people are more physically fit than other people, so they'll do um, maybe traffic control, which I think is a lot of work. Um, I like to sit at the table and register people. That's so, you know, then you get to meet a lot of people in town that you might not have met before, and, um, and it's not, uh, and you only have to, you could sign up for an hour, two hours, or the whole time, whatever. Um, so it's, it's geared towards what you want to do and what you can do and what you're interested in doing. Um, if you're interested in shelters, um, like she said, we had one in the winter, and what we do is we put the beds out. It's for people who, like it was a snowstorm, and some people lost their power and didn't have heat, so they have a place to go. And it's nice to be a part of providing that. Um, we work with the CERC group as well, who um, also do th train their volunteers to do like emergency rescues and things like that. But as she said, we haven't had to do that yet. Thank you, God. Um, it's a lot of fun. You get to meet some really cool people. Um, and um, I can't say enough about the, the whole thing. We will have, we're going to be having a meet and greet um, in November. And so if anybody's interested in just kind of hearing more about it and, and meeting some of the other people that are volunteering, anybody's welcome to come to that. Um, I'll make sure it's posted someplace that for people in the center to be able to see. You do get training, 
and the trainings can be, and again, you sign up for whatever trainings you want, but like if for the shelters, they did a training that taught us how to help people who are coming into a shelter. I mean, it's traumatizing to have to go to a shelter or whatever, and they train you how to help or what, what you want to do. Some people didn't want, uh, people, people, so they wanted to take care of the animals. So there was a, a person that came in that did shelters with animals and taught those people, what do you do with the animals? How do, you, how do you help them feel safe and help the people that are in the shelter know that they're being taken care of and, and things like that. Um, so the, there's psychological training. Then they sometimes do some trainings where you get to, I love this one, I got to have them make me up like I was all wounded. I got to be a wounded person, and and they do and the, and they in they do an emergency thing. So you're not, you kind of have a sense. Who knows when an emergency happens, what you're going to be like? But you have a sense of what to expect, and then you've got all the other people around you who also just want it to go well and want to support you in doing well. So it's it's really fun. So if you if you want to know anything else about it, and you see me around, stop me and ask me, and I'll be glad to help you. Medical. I don't do medical either. So guess what I do? <laughs> I'm Kathy. I'm a registered nurse, and I've been on the MRC since the beginning, um, on the executive steering committee with Nancy. And um, if you have a medical background, we always use nurses to, of course, do vaccinations. Um, we have physicians on board, we have um, pharmacists, anyone. We have behavioral therapists to help um, in stressful situations. And some of the reasons um, we practice every year with our flu clinic is to be ready if something major should occur. Because obviously practice helps for the same reason. You do CPR every couple of years. You may have learned it 20 years ago, but you want to practice it so that if you need to use it, it's there. Well, um, a good example is we use our major flu clinic as a pandemic practice, um, long before COVID, obviously. But what, when it became apparent it was very useful was um, back in 2009, H1N1 flu, I don't know if anyone remembers, that was the flu that was targeting children were becoming very sick. And a number of children were dying much higher rate than ever before. So they, as soon as the vaccine became available, they um, set up a flu, uh, H1N1 flu clinic for children here in Walpole. And um, because of our training through our regular flu clinics, we were able to vaccinate 700 children in under five hours. So that was one example. Um, another example was when we had a situation in the district, the school district, with a um, an adult staff person who came down with what appeared to be possible measles. Unfortunately, this person had s spoken at a conference similar to this in front of 100 people, and it was a training where there were small groups, and as the leader of the conference had spoken to each group. Well, measles is even more highly contagious than COVID, so you can only imagine. So um, once it became apparent that there might be a potential, um, we had 48 hours to find out which staff members that had attended that had been immunized as young children or were old enough, meaning born before 1957, to have reliably have had measles. Um, we worked with the state and they sent over measles vaccines and anyone who didn't meet those criteria of being fully immunized or had had measles, measles as a child was immediately vaccinated so that they wouldn't come down with measles because it could be very detrimental. Um, uh, some of the trainings I've gone to have included other types of situations. For instance, one tabletop exercise we went to um, was based on a scenario that one of the trains derailed right outside Walpole Center. It was carrying hazardous gas. And immediately, everyone within a one mile radius had to be evacuated. So how would you do that? Keep in mind, if you're talking about Walpole Center, it's the middle of the day, you have two schools in session. How do you reliably evacuate all those students, notify their parents where they can be picked up, how do you get everyone else out of there? Um, and the you know 
At the time, there weren't any apartment buildings. This was pre, but now we would have the apartment buildings would be a lot more people to evacuate as well. So that's another tabletop exercise we've gone through. You also have the ability to do incident command training, which now can be done online. Um, and that's, that's based on a system that comes down again from the federal government um, based on um, you can go through steps and actually go through 10 courses um, and become an incident um, command site commander and know exactly who to assign to which jobs. So when we go to the flu clinic, as Nancy and Barbara have spoken about, we have greeters, we have registration, we have a first aid section where somebody monitors anyone who's getting their first flu shot, they have to stay for 15 minutes, or if somebody starts to feel unwell. We have um, behavioral therapists, what are the other, um, vaccinators of course, that's fine. If you go to the flu clinic, you probably want your vaccine. Traffic control, exactly, um, and then we have um, people who do nice little things like give the young kids their lollipops and coloring books too. That's a fun job. So I'm not sure what we call that, but. That's the behavioral. Behavioral. <laughs> so we, and I would have to say that when we do run a flu clinic, there are many more non-medical staff than medical staff there. And that's the key to what's making it work so efficiently. And the practice each year is wonderful. We also have a meet and greet every year. And ours is coming up November. Uh, none of us can remember the date, so that's, we'll figure that out. But um, it's um, usually, at, um, it's going to be here this year, it, right here probably. And it's going to be a speaker from um, Norwood, who's, he's a, uh, from the police department and works on, um, so you may have heard that um, uh, there is a focus with when pe the police go out, um, helping policemen train our police personnel how to help people with mental health issues. Because what they find is a lot of people might, um, so someone calls 911 and that person, they don't need to be arrested, they need help. They need to find the resources for anxiety or depression or something else. So the speaker is gonna speak to us about the mental health um, side of it and what's available for um, uh, people in Walpole. So we always have a great speaker. There's usually light refreshments. Um, a chance to get a badge, sign up, um, get on the, the email list for any trainings that are coming up. We offer CPR one to two times a year, depending on interest for the lay person. Um, there's a few of us that are trained as CPR instructors. And it, it's been a great, great opportunity um, and a wonderful experience. So highly urge any of you that are interested to please grab some of the brochures over here. Thank you. And just one last thing, um, volunteering is really seamless too. So if they have a clinic, they post it, you'll get an email saying there's gonna be a clinic and then it has all the opportunities that you could sign up for. So if you wanna be a greeter, you, you can sign up and we'll say we need three greeters, we need four of these, we need three of these. And you just see where it is and what the hours are and if it works for you, you sign up for it. Very easy, so come. <laughs> I'm sold. <laughs> um, Amanda, do you want to come up and speak about New Life Furniture Bank? Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name's Amanda Hartley. I am the volunteer and development coordinator over at New Life Furniture Bank, which is right off of Elm Street. Many of many people in town know where we are. Some don't always, but so. We are a nonprofit and we accept gently used furniture and household goods and in turn give that away to individuals or families that transition out of homelessness and into some type of housing, some sort of permanent housing. So ultimately what we do is throughout the course of the week, we have a series of different volunteer shifts with a variety of different tasks required. So. Um, for instance, one of the shifts is sorting household goods. Um, for, as you can imagine, for someone moving into an empty apartment or an empty home, they have nothing to work with. So we have teams of volunteers that sort through glasses, 
silverware, dishes, pots and pans, et cetera, determine its use and if it's in good condition to give away, um, spot clean it, treat it so it's clean and presentable, and package it up for a client to take when they have an appointment. So just to step back and explain the mission a little bit, um, individuals that transition out of homelessness are typically working with some sort of social service agency or an advocate. The advocate will submit a referral for this particular client on our website. And that client enters into a queue and gets into an appointment slot. One of our volunteer roles is virtually meeting with that client to determine what they're looking for when they move into their new space. So there is a remote role that's also a possibility. It does require some training, some sort of um, computer savviness in our software. Um, and what these volunteers do is they have an hour-long conference call with the client and show them photographs of the furniture. And we have in this website our inventory of household goods so a client moving into a space can determine what fits in their space and what they need and that's everything from a bed to a couch or a dresser and a kitchen table to uh, pots and pans dishes silverware glasses etc so um, all of this stuff that happens on a day-to-day -day basis is all volunteer run. New Life only has four staff members. I'm one of four, and one of them is part-time. So we are so lucky to have our volunteer base come and support us. Um, so something like sorting household goods is a three-hour shift, which is a rough estimate you know you can come early you can or like come late you can leave early depending on what your schedule allows and sort through household goods to help us move that process along so it could go out to a client um, another type of shift is an inventory or furniture processor you would uh, clean and inspect incoming furniture so anything from a dining chair to a couch kitchen table, we, we inspect it and put potentially you know, clean up some scratches if we can, determine whether or not it's suitable to someone. We don't wanna give away heavily damaged furniture. We don't want to give away stained or torn pieces of furniture. So that's a really impactful role to determine its suitability to go out to someone. Um, that role can sometimes involve moving the furniture, but uh, but we always respect everyone's boundaries, um, and it wouldn't be required for you if it was something you weren't comfortable with. Um, and then we do have two different types of furniture moving roles, which one of which is called order gathering. So after the client has had their meeting and they've picked what they are going to be receiving, we have teams of volunteers that come in. It's two afternoons a week, Tuesday and Thursday, and um, and then Wednesday morning, and they gather those items. Would they get a? They have a list in our software of what pieces are being collected, and they pull all of that together using pallet jacks, using dollies, um, these eight, custom eight-foot dollies that we make. So no one is transporting a dresser by with their own strength down a hall and things like that. They're brought down to our main floor, and a, and a, usually a professional mover comes and picks it up the next day. So our volunteers' role in the furniture moving is limited to just gathering it all together, leaving it in a safe assembly, and getting it to our elevator to be brought down and then unloaded just on the main floor. So we do have roles suitable for any, any, um, anyone. You know, whether you enjoy moving furniture or you would prefer to do something on a lighter lifting, again, we respect everybody's boundaries and interest level. Um, personally, I, as a visual learner, I always want to extend an opportunity for someone to take a tour of the facility of our warehouse and determine whether or not you feel you'd want to do something like that. I think the idea of having a furniture bank a lot, um, we want to remove the notion that it's always heavy lifting. So I would welcome anybody to come in for a tour if you'd like. Um, on the on the table over here, I do have a couple of different um, pieces that you could take with you regarding volunteering. Um, and another way that you could contribute is if you ever have any good condition furniture or household goods. I mean, this is, we are truly unable to serve these individuals without the support of our community. And Walpole has been very kind to us. Many of you may know of us and it maybe perhaps has donated stuff. Um, we serve 15 clients a week. 
So in order to do that, we have the need for 15 kitchen tables a week, 15 dressers, 15 couches, et cetera, as well as silverware, dishes, mixing bowls, and very simple, very simple basic needs that many of these individuals don't have. So we, again, I strongly encourage anyone interested um, to, you can, I'll leave my business card as well. You can email and reach out and maybe come up and visit. We are located on the fourth floor of our building. There is a freight elevator that operates manually, so a trained volunteer or a trained staff member would operate it on your behalf, but we're happy to accommodate that if you wanted to come and check it out or if you were interested in volunteering. It's definitely something that we'd be happy to assist with. So, thanks so much. Thanks, Amanda. Last but not least, Robert. Thank you, Jeff. You're welcome. Well, hello, everybody. I do want to say that it is very uh, twilight zone -y for me to be in front of a live group of people and not just seeing you on Zoom. <laughs> because things are opening up now, and uh, I'm still used to primarily meeting with everybody on Zoom. And it's wonderful to see you alive and well. Some of you wearing masks. I do wear a mask. Um, in most indoor cases, but I'll just keep my six, my six feet of distance here. So I'm here to talk to you about Norfolk County Retired Senior Volunteer Program. I've been the director of this program for eight years now, and we cover volunteer opportunities for people all over the county. We primarily recruit volunteers for about 40 different partner sites. So we do recruit volunteers for Meals on Wheels. Uh, actually, I did have a nice experience before COVID at New Life Furniture, where we started working on the opportunity. It's a nice, it's a cool, it is a cool warehouse. I recommend you all do check it out. So uh, we, I was impressed with the warehouse, my colleague and I were, and now uh, connecting to this young lady, I'm hoping that we can renew our interest and possibly do additional recruitment. So we do recruit for organizations, primarily. Uh, we receive a federal grant from what is known as AmeriCorps Seniors. How many of you have heard of AmeriCorps? Okay, well, now older adults are on the bandwagon of, of AmeriCorps. We're called AmeriCorps Seniors, and we've been in existence since 1971, but we were known as National Senior Corps. But we're hoping to get more visibility now as a national program under the AmeriCorps umbrella. You know, so we receive this grant which allows us to do so much good work in the community. We need to look at grant guidelines. We fill out a completed, uh, we, we have to reapply for new grants every three years. So it's, it's a bit of work, but they give us a good amount of money in addition to the Norfolk County commissioners supporting us to uh, do great work in the community. The opportunities range from, our flagship program is the only in-house program that we run, it's free rides for veterans. So we're very proud, this is the only program we dispatch and we do our own legwork on making the program run. All the other programs, we basically have partner sites that we place volunteers on. So it's a very flexible program. We do ask that people know how to use a computer so that you're gonna be able to uh, access uh, rides online and sign up for them easily. Uh, if you're interested in that and any of these opportunities, speak to me, please, later. Um, if you are a veteran or know of veterans that could use free rides, you could send them our way as well. I have business cards and literature to pass on to you. Another prime program of ours is elementary school tutoring, and uh, we are privileged to have one of your own as our lead school volunteer. She's in the audience today, and that's Joanne Douglas. Uh, Joanne and Chris Goldsmith, who's also our volunteer coordinator, 
run the school program matching volunteers to different elementary schools uh, for, uh, I use the word tutoring, but Joanne wouldn't. Uh, and I actually would like, Joanne, for you to share the current update of schools since you're here, and you could speak better to it than me. Why don't you come on up? Okay, go ahead. This has never been a problem for me. Okay. <laughs> Teach school for a little while, and nobody, nobody needs to have a mic. Um, um, as everyone's aware, um, COVID has, um, has been uh, an, an interesting uh, ride um, for the schools and also for the volunteers. Um, so um, for in 2020, things just sort of shut down, as you'll recall. Um, the following fall, we had um, our volunteers went remote. So we had um, some schools that had remote volunteers because we serve um, partner schools all over Norfolk County. Um, and then um, last year, the schools started opening up and they had limited volunteers. This year, we, everyone seems to be, you know, all about really opening up. So the um, uh, schools are contacting us and saying we're, we're looking for our volunteers. We have a number of volunteers that um, return to the same schools year after year, and some of those are returning to schools they haven't been to for two years, so they're excited. Um, our volunteers tend to work with small groups of kids, um, mostly with reading, some math, um, sometimes school libraries. Um, and um, we do um, uh, sort of an umbrella. We help place them um, and troubleshoot if something comes up. And you can imagine teachers retire, teachers um, you know, go out on maternity leave, and then we sometimes help them find a new teacher to work with in that school or, or work with the principals to have that happen. Um, we do some training for our volunteers, for our school volunteers. Um, I don't know. What did I miss? <laughs> what, are, what are the current needs as you're looking at this year? I know it's, it's a lot of factors. Ah, current needs, Robert says. Um, it would appear that what I'm hearing principals looking for is um, uh, K-1 and 2. Um, cut, uh, reading, you know, working with small groups and reading under a teacher. Nobody's expected to make their own lesson plans. Um, most of our volunteers work an hour or two a week. It's not a huge commitment. It's not like you have to be there all day, every day. Um, and we have a couple of volunteers now that are working with fourth and fifth graders. We have one gentleman who's really looking forward to working with fifth graders in math. Now, wouldn't be my top choice, but you know, there you go. <laughs> um, and um, it, it's kind of, it's different from school to school. Um, so a, a, um, the principals, um, our usual, our contact is, our, is the principal of the school, and the principals, uh, their needs change. So it, it, it changes, um, but I think there's also a social piece that's really important for kids. It's an intergenerational thing, and, um, and we see more and more of our kids need that intergenerational piece. So, um, but, um, did I do okay, Robert? <laughs> You're a lifesaver, Joe. You are, you're such an asset to us. And you didn't need the mic, it's true. Because you have such a booming voice. I like having the mic, though. So yes, the elementary school program is uh, our only intergenerational school program. And it's, it's wonderful for older adults to have the opportunity to, to be with elementary school children and experience that energy. And it, it peps up a lot of people, and it's, you can imagine. You can imagine. So with the 40 partner sites that we have, 
Senior centers are, of course, key. We recruit volunteers that are age 55 and older. That's what it means to be an AmeriCorps seniors volunteer. Now, age 55 to 75 isn't even considered senior anymore. I mean, you know, it's like the 75 is the new 65. But, you know, there are activities, whether you want to be doing something physical or driving or on telephone, doing something. And it can be as little as, you know, one or two hours a week. Um, partner sites include the veteran hospitals, where you could be an ambassador, typically, and a lot of these are, are outside of Walpole. There will be some opportunities outside of Walpole. If you're driving somewhere, we can give you mileage reimbursement, especially nowadays with the cost of gasoline. That is helpful. We also offer supplemental accident and liability insurance. Nothing's happened in, you know, 35 years, but it's nice to know that if something were to happen, you do, while you are volunteering or in transport to volunteering, that you will have that coverage. It's insurance. It's nice to know that that's part of what you would get as an RSVP volunteer. So being an ambassador at one of these hospitals at Jamaica Plain, West Roxbury, or um, Brockton, there is also a need now for more volunteers who are a bit computer savvy, but not terribly to be able to learn the My Healthy Vet program. This is a web-based program so that veterans would be able to order their medications uh, online or set up appointments. And when uh, veterans are at the hospital, if they're not familiar with the system, they could have an opportunity to meet a volunteer in one of the offices who would show them how to uh, operate uh, the website. So that, that's gratifying in that way too. English is a second language with the number of immigrants that are uh, around. Uh, fortunately, we are able to assist with people who, uh, both through remote and in-person learning, who want to learn English. There are opportunities primarily through the um, uh, right now, I'd say our primary uh, partner site is the uh, Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center. That's in Quincy. We do have work with uh, the Stoughton Library, and they have a very progressive program with a lot of uh, a lot of training. But typically, once you're uh, you know at the point that you do the uh, you know ten hours of training online. Then you would just have, uh, you know, a meeting with a client once a week for like an hour, either remotely over the phone or in person. There are many opportunities for that. I mentioned Meals on Wheels. And technically, between Meals on Wheels and the senior centers, I'll just mention to Deb, too, that our grant will allow us to consider any of your volunteers as RSVP volunteers, if they would like to join our, uh, our network, you would be getting a, uh, a newsletter every two months about different activities. You know, we really look at ourselves as offering a sense of building community through a larger network, offering a network of opportunities for you. So we have the newsletter. We just finished a, uh, a wonderful luncheon that we have every year. That's actually the first time we were back to an in-person luncheon uh, for a group of about 112 people that we had in Dedham. Gifts, raffle prizes, a lot of fun, a good lunch, catered, I'm trying to coax you to consider <laughs> getting involved. Isn't that, isn't that good? Yeah, Joanne? I hadn't gotten there, but now I will. I mean, outside of English as a second language, friendly visiting is something we have through two partner sites. One is uh, Hebrew Senior Life, the primary facility, Newbridge on the Charles in Dedham, but also through the Massachusetts Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, MABV. 
Uh, we have opportunities for you to go into different people's homes. Could be in Walpole, could be in neighboring towns, for you to visit with a visually impaired or blind individual once a week, take them food shopping. Different people have different needs. Some of them would like you to accompany them, taking them food shopping, uh, or going to their house and helping them pay bills, or reading to them. It's, it's a nice thing that uh, there are a few people that would just like to have somebody come read the newspaper to them. In one case, somebody's reading a, a novel, a book that they like to them. So how many opportunities are there to, to read to somebody if, if you enjoy narration, let's say? Um, so what I miss, Joanne? You're keeping track, right? Yes. Yes. Friendly visiting, rides for vets, veteran hospitals, English as a second language, um, volunteering in your senior center, you know, some nice benefits as an RSVP volunteer, as Deb knows. Uh, some of our centers do have um, knitters that contribute Afghans to us. Uh, and we'll distribute to the VA hospitals. Likewise, some of the centers have singing groups that will participate in the community. I know that's been an on-off thing here, but if that ever comes back, you know, that's something that we would be happy to uh, host as well. So I think I've covered all the bases. I thank Joanne. I thank all of you for having an interest to learn about what's going on. Stay well. Come see me if you want more information. Thank you, Robert. Um, really pleased to have both professional and personal relationships with each of these organizations. Um, Robert, I've actually been on the board of um, the advisory board of the RSVP program for five, six, something like that, years. And um, just to reiterate, any of these volunteer opportunities that are out there can be done in collaboration with RSVP. Um, I know Karen has participated in both, and um, Joanne certainly. Um, Joanne does everything. <laughs> she does many programs here. But it, it, as Robert mentioned, it's a, an opportunity to uh, be part of a, another community and you know participate in their volunteer recognition and meet some of the other volunteers so that's really nice um, new life on a personal level i love donating to them um, they've been great not sure if they do it anymore but they used to go pick up furniture in people's homes volunteers would do that do you still do that yeah yeah right but um fabulous fabulous um opportunity Okay, sorry, Robert, the, the cable can't pick you up without talking in the microphone. Sorry. Yes, I should have mentioned that. Thank you. So uh, I'm sorry, but one of our uh, partner sites is the American Red Cross. So if you're interested in being an ambassador, helping out at blood drives locally and surrounding towns, we could set you up with that as well. Also through places like... Um, South Shore Elder Services, I think HESCO to some extent now, uh, long-term care ombuds persons that want to help out. And I know there's an extensive training for that, but it means you would be trained to be able to go into nursing homes and be able to screen for how well patients are being treated and, and, and listen to stories. Um, and lastly, money management, helping uh, other folks uh, who need some help with money. And very lastly, tax assistance. As we come up, we, uh, we are working with um, QCAP, Quincy Community Action Program, for remote or in-person tax assistance. I've covered it all now. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Um, and also the MRC. I just, you know, we, we have you here for all these clinics, but I don't think I really fully understood the depth and, and breadth of what you do. How amazing. Um, we're so lucky to have that. I don't know if every town has an MRC. 15, that's it. Yeah. I don't, anyway, fabulous, fabulous. Um, does anyone have any questions? 
No questions yet. So everybody's going to stay here a little bit. If you have any specific questions, please come up and um, chat with them individually. And I thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs>